So, December is here. We're recording this on the 2nd and I'm already behind with my Advent candle, so it's not started well. Tells you everything about how organised I'm feeling about Christmas. Rosie Dawson is here and Leo Devine. I bet you're more on it than I am. Are you, Rosie? Yeah, you'd be surprised. Okay. Absolutely Leo, not. Leo, you on it? I'm very on it, yeah. Completely yeah, really? on it. Oh, dear. It's a great way to start the day. I'm Hannah Scott Joint. This is the Religion Media Centre podcast. So let's think about some stories you've picked up this week. Leo, what have you noticed? Yeah, well, looking at the Religion Media Centre email, where great stories come every single day, I noticed that Pope Francis, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, and also uh, the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, Dr Ian Greenshields, are doing a joint visit to South Sudan uh, in the new year, which is a really good example of Christian unity and uh, ecumenism. But um, also just took my mind back, Rosie, to when we spoke to Bishop Zechariah from South Sudan. His diocese is 90% underwater, if you remember that story. You know, and how, how often do we report Africa, really, in terms of the mainstream media? You know, 90% underwater because in no small part, to climate change. Mm. So hopefully uh, the visit will cast some light, some media light onto that. Mm, mm, absolutely. Um, I've been fascinated by this this week by interviews with the musician Nick Cave. It was on Newsnight, the Church Times have got an interview, um, all sorts of people have got interviews with him. It's off the back of the publication of his memoir, Faith, Hope and Carnage, which is a Sunday Times bestseller. I don't know, have you, have you come across it? Have you seen any of these interviews? Just, I think I read one of the interviews, yeah. Oh, just just fascinating. This book collates 40 hours of conversation with his friend, the journalist Sean O'Hagan. Really extraordinary discussions they had over lockdown about grief, about faith, forgiveness, creative practice. Uh, at the centre, of course, he and his wife's terrible grief from losing their 15-year-old son, Arthur, who died in 2015. So interesting. There's been a Christian theme running through uh, some of his lyrics over, over many years. And obviously, it's a, a winding road. But, but through the grief, he's been brought back into the church and become a regular part of uh, the congregation at just a regular Church of England church. So it's been really fascinating to, to, to read the interviews and the book is on my Christmas list. So hoping that somebody else is organised enough to have bought it for me, but we shall see. Uh, Rosie, how about you this week? Uh, well, I was itching to mention this story last week, uh, but there wasn't time. But actually, it might be more appropriate this week because in Northern Ireland, a local council decided to put up a plaque to commemorate eight women and a man who was convicted of witchcraft in 1711. And the original wording was going to say, the town now recognises your innocence. And this, this prompted a spat between an Ulster Unionist councillor and an Alliance Party councillor. The Ulster Unionist politician said, well, it's not really in our power to overturn a verdict. And the Alliance councillor said, how can you be accused of being a witch if there's no such thing as a witch? Which led me to ask whether witches showed up in the census this week. And they did. There are 13,000 Wiccans in the country and in Mansfield. It's the 14th most popular religion. Oh, oh, that is interesting. Hadn't spotted the Mansfield thing. Well, of course, the big news this week was always going to be the 2021 census. Much anticipated, much predicted. The results were finally published this week. The headlines of which seem to be that fewer than half the population of England and Wales would describe themselves as Christian. A decline from 71% in 2001 down to 46% in 2021. Uh, also, that 10.8% of people in England and Wales belong to other faith groups, up from 8.4% in 2011. But perhaps most significantly, the rise of the non-religious to 37%, that's 22.2 million people ticking the none box, that's the N-O-N-E, none box. So with us to talk round this a bit are sociologist Lois Lee, who led the research programme Understanding Unbelief at the University of Kent, and Chinny MacDonald, director of Theos, the Think Tank, exploring the place of religion and faith in society. Now, this is clearly going to be way more nuanced, nuanced than the bald figures suggest. But Lois, this does seem to be a significant shift away from Christianity, doesn't it? Is that how you see it? There's definitely a big change. I mean, it's funny with census figures, they tell us something we were totally expecting, which is this very long-term trend in which we see a decline of Christianity in particular and a growth of people identifying as no religion. But it crystallises something, doesn't it? It's, it's, it's really striking seeing those figures, seeing those kind of raw numbers, the many millions of people that have shifted in their identity 
And you can see in the conversations going on around it that there's a lot we're squaring up to as a result of that. A really interesting moment, I think. Mm. Ginny, how do you see it, This partic- particularly this decline in the numbers identifying as Christian? Well, interestingly, people like my mum kind of called me and said, what, what's happened on our watch? The UK is no longer a Christian country. Now, as Lois said, no one is surprised by any of these figures because can you imagine if 46% of the population turned up at church on Sunday? I mean, we we would be shocked. We would think that there was kind of some massive revival. And the numbers of people actually at churches, which is the best indicator of having a uh, practicing Christian faith is in the kind of very low millions rather than the tens of millions. But I think what is striking is that it has potentially decreased more rapidly than we thought it might. I think there was previously it had been predicted that it would be kind of less than half the population by around 2030. So it's happened a bit a bit quicker. But I do think that it's it's more reflective even though it is a massive overrepresentation of the numbers of Christians there are in the UK today. Tease out with both of you the, the issue of the noms, because Chinny, Theos Think Tank have done some interesting research looking at these noms, and you've identified three types of them. The, the spiritual non, you tell me, you tell me the others. The spiritual nuns, the campaigning nuns, and the tolerant nuns. So the spiritual nuns are make up the vast majority of nuns, actually, nuns, people who, yes, they don't identify with a particular religion, but they are spiritual, spiritual, but not religious. They are very likely to believe in God or a higher power. They sometimes practice religious-ish types of ritual. And then there are the campaigning nuns. So they are the kind of small uh, percentage of kind of campaigning, militant and non-believers, people who are not very happy about religion, often the militant atheists. And then there are the tolerant ones who, who, who don't believe in God, who aren't religious, but they have no big issue with religious belief. So those are the kind of three categories. And, and Lois, you, you led the Understanding Unbelief project. And, and what this research seems to be showing is that the nons are not unbelievers i'm i'm just wondering what your take on on that is and indeed on the on the the name of your project i mean is that in the end what you have come to understand unbelief or are you understanding something much much wider than those who do not believe yeah well i definitely agree with tinny that that on that understanding well the focus on unbelief is i mean we used it with scare quotes we knew it was going to be a problematic term why have we got this language that's about what people are not when we know they are many many things so i i, I agree with that i think that we do need to take seriously the number of atheists people who don't believe in in god in this country we know that in 2018 in the british social attitude survey it does its you know once in a decade research on religion as well and in those figures the number of atheists outnumbered the number of theists for the first time in this country and so the figures we're seeing today echo broader changes in belief as well so i think i'm i'm wary of going in the direction of saying these non-religious people are actually sort of a bit religious and they're not there's nothing new that's happened here I'm equally wary of that idea that we've got religious plur- uh, diversity going on and then this big no religion group that we sort of sit very awkwardly with. And I think the kind of research that Chinny's talking about, the kind of work I'm doing, suggests we really need to move from an idea of religious diversity to worldview diversity. And you don't get that in the language of the census, absolutely. And that's a real, a real issue. We need to develop a better language for understanding those positions and the, the research that Theos have been, has been doing is a really welcome contribution to that. I wonder about some of that language of tolerance and campaigning when we're talking about worldviews. I think some of the work we've been doing has been trying to start as a starting point, looking at the beliefs people have and just trying to be very descriptive about that. Because one thing we know about people is we're all tolerant and intolerant to different degrees and so on. And then we're going to find that within every orientation. So I kind of want to strip back down first and look at the beliefs that those those groups have and then say something about how they're positioned um, in relation to other other groups. In, in a way, I think we're running before we can walk when we use that kind of that kind of language. But that's exactly what we need to be doing, getting that fine grain. Yeah. So, Ch- Chinny, what would you say to what to Lois's point there? I totally 
agree. I think some of us can get quite excited when we look at that kind of non-religion box and we see, you know, 50% of them kind of believe in something. And I think for the church or for Christians, that probably is our warm audience. So the ones that might be up for thinking a bit about our ideas around God. And probably to explain the kind of wider context of our the rise of the nuns research, it came out of a massive project on science and religion. So actually what we were looking at uh, when drawing out those kind of three categories were what people believe uh, or what religion they belong to, but how they go about it. So that's what comes out. That's where they're kind of Tolerance, intolerance comes out. It's it's p- particular attitudes and ways of seeing religious belief, which show that some people are actually kind of hate hate religion and they're up for talking about how much they hate it all the time, whereas some kind of pretty tolerant. I think one thing that is interesting, I, I guess, in the census in is that it it is limited in what it can show us about the world. What we're talking about in terms of that forty six percent who uh, ticked the Christian box is they were asked what religion are you? So they tick that. And so you've got to be kind of very sure that you are uh, aligned with that religion to tick that box. There will be some people, a kind of fruity type of Christian, (laughs) who might say, actually, I'm not a Christian, but I am a follower of Jesus, um, and therefore not want to be boxed into the kind of religious institution box. There's also been lots of a disillusion disillusionment over the past few years with Christianity, obviously um, abuse scandals, um, the crises of leadership. So all of that is playing into how much people feel that they can identify and therefore tick a box that says Christian. Does that also reflect something at the moment about people not wanting to label themselves generally, not wanting to kind of join, nail themselves to a, you know, to a particular mast? I mean, is there a sense of that, Lois, that we're, we're less inclined to do that? That's definitely a big part of the picture. And that's why we don't have very good language for talking about non-religious worldviews, because people themselves don't have that language. People don't talk about themselves as humanists when they do have a set of beliefs that conform very closely to a humanist set of beliefs. And that's to do with that decentralisation in culture. But I think we often take people too much at their word in that, uh, in the same way that people don't join political parties in the way they did before. But we don't leap to thinking they're totally apolitical, they've got no views, they're not going to vote. We wait to see what they actually do. And we have find other ways of learning about them. Also, we improve our public conversation, which helps us all with that, with develop that language. And I think that's part of what's happening now in which the census will kind of motor forward and crystallise. That said, one thing we should be aware of is the research show that the non-religious really like the label non-religious in the UK. So it's a distinctive cultural category. In the US, it's much less popular with non-believers to call themselves non-religious. They like terms like atheist and so on. It's a cultural phenomenon. We're so used to thinking about this as the absence of a position, and that's not what's going on. So in the US, the language of the secular and atheism, they have very different meanings. But being secular is something that's politically really valuable. Everyone wants to position themselves as secular. Being secular is what it means to be American in many ways. And then it has all these different connotations. Different different history in the UK, different things are going on. And just saying I'm not religious, which is actually about a kind of liberal tolerance, an idea of I don't want to be forcing my views onto you. The, the concept, uh, the term atheism is sometimes thought of as intrinsically aggressive. If I say I'm an atheist, you think I'm anti-religious and that's not what I am. Really different kind of ways of describing each other. So whilst I'm saying we need to be able to identify those worldview beliefs in much more kind of concrete terms, I do think we can be a little bit respectful of the non-religious category because people use it about themselves and they quite like it. I'm really interested in that, Lois, that sort of shift in this generational thing of labelling yourself. It's, it's the old, when you go into hospital, what do you write down on the form? I was with my uh, university students yesterday and I asked them what they put on the census. And they all said, all of them apart from one, sorry, said, well, I, I put no religion because I, I don't have any kind of cultural reference. You know, and that's the kind of the shift, I think, maybe that we've seen. But I'm very interested in what you're saying about this sense of not wanting to label yourself. Yeah, to, I'm also really privileged to to have joined in a project recently with Anna Strahan and Rachel Shillito, sociologists who work with children, and their project is working with eight to 11-year-olds, so a really interesting group. And 
again, you see that kind of idea that if religion is the center of how we think about what's going on, that there's been a supply side failure, as it were, that our churches aren't fun enough. They don't bring pets into the church and so on. That's everything that's going on. We seem to be missing the point because children are developing non-religious identities to which they're quite attached at quite a young age. So that has to be a big part of the picture as well. Leo, you went out and had a chat with some people uh, in the last yeah. couple of days, haven't you? Yes, I, I thought, well, let's let's talk to some real people. Not that you're not a real person, Jimmy or Lois, but I thought, well, let's just hear what people are saying. And I, looking at that, the, that big story that came out that everybody picked up on this fall off on the figure of Christians in this country, I thought, well, I'll pop down to Truro Methodist Church, so Truro in Cornwall. And I went there because I knew they were running a food bank that day. And I know that they have a low-cost cafe for people who are perhaps homeless or are caught in this trap of the poverty trap of the cost of living crisis. Um, I went in there. All of the volunteers were in their 70s. Uh, I asked them what were they worried about what was happening. And the main thought is around, will there be volunteers in the future to run these vital services that local authorities should run or can't run? Uh, in the future, if there is no sort of affiliation to a faith group, not just Christians, but a faith group that provide these services. This is what they had to say. Basically, I'm not surprised. I mean, if, if you look at the numbers attending churches, you look at the churches in decline, churches having to close up and down the country. Uh, I think I'd be very surprised if people said that there were still a, the same number of people who are saying they're Christian. And I think increasingly people think more about their answer and they just learn automatically say, I'm a Christian just because I was baptised in the Church of England or whatever. I'm not at all surprised. I think, um, whereas in the past, probably people automatically put Christian because they maybe went to a church school or they were christened. Increasingly, people, young people, children, have no links with, with churches at all. And, and I think, therefore, the idea of um, being Christian, no, I don't know anything about that. So they would, they would not tick for it. I think it's a generational thing. Not only is it a shame for people who haven't got the security of a belief in Christianity, it's also dire for the activities that go on in church, reaching out to people like the food bank and like um, the cafe we've got here and so on. We need those people to staff things and it's fundamentally from the Christian beliefs that they have been established. Yeah, I think the makeup of the country's population has changed and is changing, you know, um, um, much wider ethnic uh, variety and so on. So inevitably that will happen. Uh, a lot of people, I think, in the past have said, oh, I'm Christian, when ne not necessarily going to church. And probably at the, this moment in time, it's not like fashionable to say that you go to church. I'm looking around the church now and there's the ladies doing the flowers. Uh, we've got the food bank happening today. You've got the cafe over there. But if you don't mind me saying, I count myself in this, yeah. we're all getting older. Exactly. Where, what about the youth? What about the young people? That, that's the problem. Um, it's difficult because I think a lot of younger people now, if they're at work, uh, they've been working more and more, they're retiring later, uh, and it is a problem to see where, where the um, people following on are going to come from. Now, we're in Truro Methodist Church, but, of course, the Church of England is the established church. Do you think that's still right if we've dropped below 50%, the Christian numbers have dropped below 50%? I was listening to somebody on the radio yesterday um, who was saying that, yes, he thought the established nature of, of the Anglican Church should be dropped, certainly. Um, I don't know that many people would be able to tell you what that means. What does established church mean? Um, I think you've got to be of a certain age <laughs> to, to appreciate that term. Well, it's going to be a coronation next year. Yes, yes. I think people just see that as a ceremony. I think we're on a slope. I th probably it's not going to change the world, whether it is dis disestablishes or whether it stays as the established church. Um, but if 10 years' time the next census shows that only 40% are Christian, then it, it 
brings the question to the fore again, if it hasn't been resolved already. But I'm, my wife is absolutely right. I'm quite sure that 80%, 90% of the population wouldn't be able to tell you what it actually means, this phrase, the established mm. church. Should there be bishops in the House of Lords? <laughs> I'm a Methodist, so <laughs> we, don't, we don't have bishops. <laughs> um, I think while there's a House of Lords, a, a spiritual input gives a breadth to the debate in the House of Lords, taking it away from purely a, a legislative assembly. Does it worry you, then, as a Christian, that Christianity it, it appears to be... Well, failing's probably the wrong word, but falling off? Um, it's sad. Uh, but then I lived... I mean, at my age, when I was a child, I went to Sunday school in the morning, guild in the afternoon, church in the evening. I come from a very strong Methodist family with, with a, a grandfather who was a lay preacher, uh, a very strict Methodist family where my mum, we had, we we're not allowed to knit on Christmas, on, on a Sunday. Um, and I think that's, people maybe still feel that that is the perception of being a Christian, which is very far from more where we are now. So there you go. Hannah, a, a range of views just at one particular church. As I said, it's not just the Methodist Church or Christianity that is providing services like they do. Lots of faith. We, we've talked well before. We've talked before about um, Sikhs, for example, for feeding people, feeding the homeless. It's multi faith. But what happens if faith begins to diminish? Where will those services come from? And also, well, some very interesting I, views about disestablishment as well. I mean, I think the really interesting thing is when they're talking about the younger generation and what. I think Lois was saying earlier about the studies of, of, of children, is that Islam, Judaism, the minority uh, religions seem to be better at instilling the values of their religion in their young. And so, and, and as you say, we all know that those other faiths provide vital welfare services as well. So, you know, as, as they increase, albeit slowly, and their infrastructure improves, you know, whether they become the sort of, you know, key providers of these services that traditionally churches have done. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, Ginny, still reeling. I'm, still, that. I'm still reeling from not being able to knit on a Sunday. So I know that's, that's not the main takeaway from this, you. but that, yes. I mean, Chinny, can we talk about this disestablishment question? which which was discussed in, in Truro Methodist Church there. I mean, um, all sorts of people are talking about this this week. Not surprisingly, Simon Jenkins in The Guardian says the case for dismantling the Church of England's relationship with the state is overwhelming. Where do you sit on that? I'm not sure where I personally sit, um, but I agree with what was said in the, in the Vox Pop in that most people wouldn't notice um, what difference does it actually make. And I think that having an established church doesn't necessarily mean that Christianity has a load of power over other uh, religions or faiths uh, in the UK. Potentially, we, we widen uh, the inclusivity in terms of kind of religious belief, so kind of bring in um, other faiths more in a, on a range of different uh, areas, including within uh, the House of Lords. But I want to pick up on, though, is the rise of Islam and other faiths and how they seem to be better um, at passing on their faith to their children. Yeah. Now, I am a I'm a real, real, really, really Christian. I'm so Christian that I do it for a job. And yet I have a s sense of self-consciousness about passing on my faith to my children. I am really wary of indoctrination and having grown up in the evangelical church. So there's a fearfulness for me um, to talk to my five-year-old or my baby about the Christian faith. Now, if I'm feeling that, then lots of other Christians who are Christian and who do, who, who do practice their Christian faith are kind of unsure about how to pass pass it on to our children if if that is something that we want to do. Um, I think though, when it comes to volunteering at food banks, etc., in the future, what young people do have is a sense of social justice. So I think there will always be that sense of if there is need, if there is poverty, there will be people, um, including young people, who will fill in the gaps if needed. Mm, Lois, yeah, re really interesting. So much interesting things to think about there. But thinking about disestablishment, I think what we might be helpful at this moment is to think about how vulnerable the space we have for thinking about ethical and existential matters is if we continue to label that space as religious. So the the bishops in the House of Lords is a really good example. The, the debate is, should we get rid of them rather than could there be a space for representation of, as, as Shinny put it so well, it may be very valuable to have that spiritual 
contribution that came through in in the in the um, interviews you were doing as well to preserve that space. And I think this cuts across so many sectors. We're going to need to relabel it and open it up to other religious and non-religious voices. And if we don't do that, it's we're just playing. It's just inevitable that it will disappear. The bishops in the House of Lords might be controversial to change, but we're seeing it at school level now that the religious education space where so many of our young people, because there is an age effect, again, we heard that in the interviews just now. So young people are very, a very large majority identifies no religion. If we think about religious education as being about learning about the religions that other people have, rather than reforming that space, so it's about the worldviews that we all have, and absolutely all of our students have a stake in that space, we'll lose the space when actually that existential and ethical dimension of life is a part of all of our lives, is crucial to the kind of ethnic plurality we're talking about, crucial to so many things. So I feel quite passionately about that, that it, we have to change that language so that we can continue having a really vital part of our public and personal lives represented. And make room for the fact that, I mean, Kate Botley said on her um, social media yesterday, she's been having fascinating conversations about and with those who aren't religious, but I'm not religious, but, you know, express some kind of sense of mystery, of possibly even the divine, of something existential, which is about lighting candles. It's about a feeling. It's about, I mean, when I was talking about Nick Cave at the beginning, you know, it's something to do with that as well, that actually in the big moments in life, in the things that that shake us and move us into places that we don't really understand, actually, that is a time when we need a kind of breadth so that there is room to explore mystery, I suppose. Is is that fair, Lois? Yeah, I, I think there are many people who are non-religious who um, cope with, who process, who engage with those moments in that, in that way. But I, I think there's a, a big space for understanding each other's worldviews much better. And so even those kind of very materialistic, even those, what, the campaigning nuns, as they're called, again, in those moments, it might not be about mystery. It might be about the joys of scientific explanation. It might be about part, how humans have accumulated knowledge and they pass it on. And because of the way we've our kind of public discourse is, which has been so adversarial in so many ways, we don't get at looking at the kind of richness to all of those different positions and what they bring into people's lives. And actually, that's where already there's really great practice in the RE classroom. The changes are happening, whether our frameworks are keeping up with them or not. And there's really meaningful conversations going on where I think our children understand worldview diversity much better than we do. Yeah, I, I think we're going to have to leave it there. It's been absolutely fascinating. Chinny, McDonald and Lois Lee, thank you so much for, for sh sharing and chatting around all this. Uh, there is absolutely more to come on it, I'm quite certain. Leo, just before we go... Have you picked up any quirks this to week? Another the Leo world. quirk. Go on. Yeah, well, I, I, it's a lovely story actually on a website I've not seen before, which is called Religion Unplugged. Uh, and yeah. it is about the Razouk Tattoo Parlor in Old Jerusalem that's been tattooing pilgrims to the Holy Land for 28 generations. The sign on the shop, I think, says, you know, been here since 1310. Doesn't mean, it doesn't mean lunchtime, it means 1310. Uh, and I didn't know it was a thing, apparently. If you go to the Holy Land, until a friend came back with a big tattoo, what was um, the tattoo of? It's the Jerusalem cross. So apparently Just they do the other things. Cross, they use they a wooden a stencil, which are ancient. They're originally from Egypt, um, and they stencil the tattoo on. And uh, the, the current Razouk, who is running the tattoo parlor, Wazim Razouk, uh, says he likes not he likes Harley Davidson motorbikes, but he likes nothing better than tattooing seventy year old grandmas who say, "I've told my children all their lives not to get a tattoo, and here I am." There you go. Go, Third girl. Time. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, that's this week's Religion Media Centre podcast. Do let us know what you think and share it widely from Leo, Rosie and myself. Thanks for spending some time with us. We'll be back next Friday. Bye for now. The Religion Media Centre is an impartial and independent organisation providing an expert resource for the media and other interested parties to help the reporting and understanding of religion and beliefs.
You can find news, fact sheets, briefings and lots more on the website at religionmediacentre.org.uk, where you can also sign up for a daily roundup of stories about religion and belief from the UK and around the world straight to your inbox. If you'd like to support the podcast and the work we do, contributions are very welcome. Thank you if you do, have or will. It all helps us continue to tell the stories that matter, and it's hugely appreciated.